Dearly beloved, we are... Oh, no, this is the wrong thing. Hang on. I knew I'd make a mistake. Okay, it gives me great pleasure to have Leila here this evening. And you know she's going to be talking about Francis Barber. And we will have a break at quarter past eight. So, and then we'll have another part of the meeting later on. But I'll, I'll leave her to talk to you already. Okay? Over you go. Thank you. You all right? Yeah, yeah, all good. Well, hi everyone. Um, thank you very much uh, for having me here and thank you all very much for coming as well. Um, so yeah, because it's Black History Month, uh, we're going to be talking about Francis Barber. Um, and it's very significant to be having a lecture about Francis Barber here in Streatham. It's an area where Samuel Johnson spent considerable time visiting the Thrale family. Uh, and there's also the Barber and um, Johnson legacy here in Streatham, which you can see just from street names, obviously we've got Francis Barber Clothes, but there's also Dr. Johnson Avenue, and of course the Francis Barber School. I've got a couple of photos there. Um, so this lecture will aim to uncover what we do know so far about one of the most important and yet least discussed figures in Johnson's life. So, Barber is also one of the few black people in the 18th century for whom a biography or a lecture of some sort is possible. Uh, we know that there was a sizable black population in Britain, but it's difficult to discuss in depth about the details of the lives of individual, everyday black men and women. Uh, we know about the lives of key figures like Ignatius Sancho or Otabako Gowano because they were writers and they attracted the attention of their contemporaries and left behind a wealth of information for future generations to explore. With Barber, the reason we know so much about him is because of his connection with Johnson, but I'm going to argue in this lecture, and hopefully you'll agree with me by the end, um, that there are various elements of his life which also relate to the lives of everyday black person in London, um, but also England more broadly. So we'll start at the very beginning. Um, so Barber was born in about 1742-43, we don't know exactly, unfortunately, uh, on a sugar plantation in Jamaica. For context, uh, Johnson was commissioned to write the dictionary in 1746, so he was already a fully grown man by the time that Barber was born. It's believed his birth name was Quashy, uh, this is based on some records, um, but it's also uh, significant to remember that enslaved people only had one name, they didn't have the two names, uh, and the name Quashy was so common that it's pretty much just synonymous with the word slave. Quashi was a house servant, and he spent his first seven or eight years in Jamaica. So by the time you're seven or eight years old, you're kind of aware of what's going on, so he would have been aware of the realities and the horrors of plantation life. The plantation he was born on uh, was owned by the Bathurst family, and during Quashi's life, Colonel Bathurst owned it, as he had done for the last 20 years. In 1749, however, he sells it, along with all of the enslaved people on it, except for the young Quashi, and the two come to London. This immediately raises some questions. Obviously, someone in Bathurst's position is going to keep at least one enslaved person. They're not going to want to get a servant all of a sudden, because then they'd have to pay wages. Um, but you'd think either taking a young man who was physically strong and capable uh, would be a good idea. Of course, you do run the risk of them then running away. So maybe you get a young woman. She's less likely to run away, uh, but she can also perform the more domestic duties. Both have their benefits, but also their risks. Um, so taking a young boy doesn't really make that much sense. So this has raised uh, some academics to wonder whether or not that Quashi may have been Bathurst's illegitimate child. Having been born into slavery, there aren't any records to prove or disprove this theory. And we know that forced relations on enslaved women by plantation owners and their family members and the resulting children was very common. And it may explain why, Quash why Bathurst chose Quashi to bring to London with him. Once in London, he has him baptised, which is where the name Francis Barber now comes in. Uh, and the debate surrounding baptism and the effect on an enslaved person's legal status had been going on since the 17th century. But it's very much a grey area. The theory is that a Christian can't be enslaved. So if you're therefore baptised, what does that make you now? It seems in kind of practical sense, it didn't have that much of an effect, but it's still an interesting thing to be thinking about. 
Um, either way, Barber didn't stay in London for that long. He was sent to Barton, which is a tiny village in North Yorkshire, uh, and he basically learned to read and write at a small school there. Now, it kind of goes without saying, but I think it's worth thinking about anyway. It's impossible to imagine the weight of the transition from being born and living on a plantation, as we said, seven or eight years old, you're kind of aware of what you're seeing, and then this adult man who, again, you are aware that he's the one responsible for a lot of the horrors and um, punishments which are taking place, he, for whatever reason, chooses you, and he takes you from the only life you've ever known on this long and arduous journey to London. You get to London, it's a lot colder than Jamaica, uh, everything's busy, bustling, you're surrounded by buildings, technology, things you've never seen before, and even I think the smell would be different, everything would be completely different, and you're surrounded by people who don't look like you. If that isn't enough, you're then sent even to an even colder place very quickly, and there's no pseudo-guardian figure there at all. At least there are some other children there, but again, none of them look like you, and you haven't even adjusted to the weather yet or anything like that. And this is a very small boy, so yeah, it's a lot to be kind of happening, I think, in a few months. Anyway, in 1752, he comes back to London, and he lives with Colonel Bathurst's son, who was a doctor called Richard Bathurst. And there's no more mention of Colonel Bathurst and Barber ever seeing each other again from this point. Richard Bathurst was a struggling doctor and, funnily enough, very anti-slavery. He was very busy uh, and so he didn't have much time to look after the young Francis Barber. He was, however, very good friends with Samuel Johnson. And in March 1752, um, Johnson's wife, Tetty, passed away. And so the following month, Richard Bathurst sent Barber to go live with Johnson. And he went to go live with him at 17 Gough Square, which is now Dr. Johnson's house, the museum. And this is the only address that's recorded and still stands where we know definitively a formerly enslaved person lived. So, okay. um, this is Johnson, obviously. Um, so just a bit of context, he's 42 years old by this point. The um, portrait doesn't really quite do it justice, but he was a very physically striking man. He suffered from scrofula as a baby, which had left him with scars and pockmarks all over his body. He was very tall, he was often described as being very rotund, and it's very likely he had Tourette's. All of his biographers have recorded various physical um, and verbal tics that he had. This is a complete contrast to the young barber, who at this point is about 10 years old, and is the only person of colour in Johnson's household. It was also a very difficult atmosphere in the house. Johnson, who suffered from depression anyway, was experiencing one of the most deepest depressions of his life. He was grieving over this wife he'd had for years. Um, he even described himself as a kind of one solitary wanderer in the wild of life, a gloomy gazer on a world to which I have little relation. So heavy stuff. But it was also in the peak dictionary years. Johnson's Dictionary was published in 1755, so in 1752, he's in the final leg of the process. And I think he's very much aware of how career-defining it was. So, a bit of a stressful time for him work-wise as well. Uh, Johnson also had six amanuenses helping him with the physical writing up, and many of them were from Scotland, and so they would speak interchangeably between English and Gaelic to one another. So again, it's a lot to take in for a small child. But I think at this point as well, Barber was able to see some of Johnson's very generous and humane characteristics. He told James Boswell, who was the author of um, The Life of Johnson, which is the definitive biography, um, that one of his earliest memories of life in Gough Square was that although the doctor had then little to himself, he frequently carried money with him to Shields when in distress. Shields was one of the amanuenses who sadly died of consumption the following year. Perhaps it wasn't all traumatizing for the young barber, though. Uh, Johnson did have a very playful and um, playful nature and some quite awkward qualities. He was commonly compared to a bear, which can be quite fun and likable for a child. Uh, and he also got on well with younger people and was very good with children as well. So despite the uh, personal and professional chaos that Barber was first experiencing Johnson in, it wasn't necessarily as dire as it might appear, or we can hope. <laughs> 
We also see examples of Barber practicing his handwriting at this time. He's practicing his own name on some scraps of paper, which were used as notes in the dictionary. So it was very likely that he was doing this in the same room as Johnson as well. And as sweet as that image is, it's also pretty amazing because 40% of adult males in Britain were illiterate in the sense that they were unable to sign their own name. So it's pretty amazing, therefore, that this little 10-year-old boy who was born on a plantation is there practicing writing his own name. So he was sent to school again, but his primary role was as, was as a servant. Um, he later recalled to Boswell that Johnson required very small attention. It seems that beside basic household tasks, his role was really just to keep Johnson company, which wasn't necessarily an easy task. Johnson's household was very varied and filled with an assortment of people. Some were only there very short term. Johnson was known to be helping friends and people in need. But the longer term tenants included Robert Levitt, who was a quack doctor who um, would go and practice medicine in the slums where he was paid in gin rather than money. So he spent a lot of time being very drunk as well. Um, there was a prostitute who was like, largely regarded as being a bit mad uh, called, called Paul Carmichael. There was a Mrs. Des Mullins who had largely tended to Johnson's wife before her death, and then a blind poetess called Anna Williams. Now, in a letter in 1778, Johnson summarized the relationship between all of them as Williams hates everybody, Levitt hates Des Mullins and does not love Williams, Des Mullins hates them both, Paul loves none of them. So not necessarily the happiest of houses for a small boy to be growing up in. Um, we do know in particular that Anna Williams clashed with Barber very frequently. After a failed cataract operation had left her blind, Williams moved into Johnson's household on a permanent basis and fulfilled a semi-housekeeping role. Her success as a housekeeper is questionable though. Johnson's friend Joseph Baretti avoided her tea because she was known to put her finger into the cup to measure how far the water was. She was also known to have a bit of a temper. Uh, her frustrations are somewhat understandable. She's gone blind. She's reportedly an insomniac. She's unable to return to writing due to her blindness. She's completely at the mercy of Gen Johnson's generosity and no one's really taken her seriously as a housekeeper. Unfortunately, however, her frustration often turned into a real temper and clashes with Barber. John Hawkins, who had known Williams for 30 years, recorded the relationship and how Johnson was often caught in the middle of Williams and Barber, saying, having his ears filled with complaints of Mrs. Williams and of Frank's neglect of his duty and inattention to the interests of his master, and of Frank against Mrs. Williams for the authority she assumed over him and exercised with unwarrantable severity. Mrs. Williams, in her paroxysms of rage, had been known to drive Johnson from her presence. But in 1755, in April, there seemed to be a bit of a change in fortune for Barber. Colonel Bathurst, we remember him from the beginning, he died, and he, in his will, left Barber 12 pounds and named him legally free. He said, I give to Francis Barber, a Negro whom I brought from Jamaica aforesaid into England, his freedom. That's a very interesting statement. Clearly, despite being baptized upon arrival to London, Bathurst, at least, did not consider Barber a free man. So that clears up the baptism debate, at least in regards to Barber. But he also clearly considered Barber's freedom as something that was his to give or withhold, despite the fact that Barber had not been part of Bathurst's household for the two years preceding the date that the will was drawn up. In terms of what Johnson felt, I think it's, we can say with certainty that he didn't view Barber as enslaved or um, his property in any way. Uh, he was very much against slavery. He'd written about it before uh, Barber was in his household, and he was against it whether in the colonies or at home. He also paid him wages, which is a clear indication of his viewing Barber as a servant at the very least. And his sending him to school is also more of a kind of guardian type decision. Johnson also defined family as those who live in the same house. And given the fact that the house was made up of people who were not blood relations to him, this is another indication of how he viewed Barber as well as the other individuals there. In terms of what Barber felt, it's difficult to say exactly. 
The only glimpse is him telling Boswell in 1786 that Colonel Bathurst made him free in his will. Regardless of whether Barber had felt truly enslaved prior to Bathurst's death and him declaring him free, it must have still been a turning point. The bequest had to go through the necessary legal formalities, so there were delays in Barber's benefiting from it. So it was only in August 1756 that he received the money, uh, but now he was declared as legally free. Uh, he had more money than he'd ever had before in his life. Um, he's around 13, 14 years old, so he's a teenage boy. Uh, and he has regular and vicious clashes with at least one member of the household. So it could be a mixture of these factors, um, or just one in particular, which ultimately led to his decision to leave 17 Gough Square in autumn 1756. And this is the home that he'd been living in for the last four years. He didn't go very far, though. He ended up an apothecary in Cheapside, which was run by Edward Ferrand. Now, Ferrand's apothecary was particularly successful and thriving, and it was in one of the most bustling areas of the city. The living situation would have been very different to Gough Square. It was common practice that the family would live in the rooms above the shop, and then the servants and apprentices in the garret rooms above that. So there were two young men apprentices when, uh, during Barber's time there, meaning he was sharing rooms with people his own age for the first time. There were also young women. Uh, Ferran's three unmarried daughters were living there with him and his wife. And what would have then been perfect for Barber is if he'd got an apprenticeship. This was the normal career path for 18th century young boys there. Uh, of course, apprentices um, covered an enormous range of trades and skills. At the very bottom rung of the ladder, we've got parish apprentices, usually working an unskilled trade or domestic service. And on the other end, we've got apprenticeships in the skilled crafts or trades, which were regulated by the livery companies of the City of London. The Worshipful Company of Apothecaries was one of these, and an apprentice would be more like a pupil rather than a labourer. An apprenticeship would have set him up for life. At the end of the seven years, he would have been made free as a freeman of the city of London with the right to set up his own apothecary within the city. It was an incredibly and increasingly lucrative and genteel profession. However, Barber was unable to do this for a number of reasons. One, there was a huge cost involved. There was a huge premium needed to gain an apprenticeship. Most of Ferran's apprentices paid sums between 100 and 150 pounds, so Barber's 12 pounds wasn't going to get him very far. Two, education. Uh, the Society of Apothecaries were very particular about their selection and education of their apprentices. Before even starting an apprenticeship, the young person would be examined on their general knowledge and, in particular, their Latin. Barber didn't know any Latin at this stage. And the final and the biggest obstacle was the colour of his skin. In 1731, a proclamation was issued by the Lord Mayor of London stating that none of the companies of the city were allowed to accept any black people as apprentices. Jews had also been barred from being apprenticed and Huguenots were also prevented from becoming freemen, but it was in 1731 that black people were added to this list. So by 1758, Barber had been with Ferrand for about two years. But in the first six months of uh, Barber's departure from Gough Square, Johnson had placed numerous adverts in the newspaper calling for Barber to return home. These kinds of adverts were common. Uh, rewards were often offered for the return of a black servant or an enslaved person. And in February 1757, Johnson had placed an advert in the Daily Advisor stating, Whereas Francis Barber, a black boy who has been for some months absent from his master and has been said to have lived lately in Wapping or near it, this is to give him notice that if he will come to his master or apply to any of his master's friends, he will be kindly received. Johnson stands out from the other adverts. He makes no threats and he offers no rewards. And the general tone is more loving than the other ones that were going on at the time. Clearly the advert worked, uh, as Barber later told Boswell how he served Ferrand for about two years, during which he called sometimes on his master and was well received. There was also an understanding that Barber would return back to Johnson when it was clear he wasn't going to go much further in the apothecary. However, he didn't do that. Instead, he did a complete 180, and in July 1758, he joined the Royal Navy. Now, previous studies have suggested that Barber was press-ganged, 
which may have happened, but there's nothing really to suggest this in actuality. It's possible, but yeah, not 100% convinced. Uh, he recorded himself as a volunteer in naval records, which either you'd do as a volunteer, or yeah, if you're press ganged, you can hardly say that, so they'd make you say volunteer. What's more compelling, though, is that the Royal Navy didn't recognize slavery. There was more of an equal treatment between the white and the black sailors. While at no point in the 18th century did the number of black sailors exceed 6%, there at least would have still been more people that um, looked like him than there were in the apothecary or in Johnson's household. They also would have been of a similar age, and it could have been an opportunity to make friends or at least work with people like himself. Also, there was decent pay. After deductions to Greenwich Hospital and to surgeons, etc., he was paid 16 shillings and six pence per month. He didn't have to pay for clothes, food, board, or medicine. Records even showing him buying tobacco for the first time, sometimes up to a twelfth of his wages. Perhaps most compelling, though, is the potential sense of adventure that there may have been. Barber's around 16 years old at this point. It's easy to imagine him wanting to spend time with people his own age, spend his own pretty decent wage, and have some adventure outside of the gloomy Fleet Street or the very commercial cheap side. However, there is, of course, the major difference between black and white sailors. If their ships captured, a black sailor was going to be sold into slavery, a fate which you know, was not shared with the white sailors. And this could very much have been Johnson's fear as well. His description of a ship sounds more like a slave ship than a navy vessel. He said, when you look down from the quarter deck to the space below, you see the utmost extremity of human misery, such crowding, such filth, such stench. A ship is worse than a jail. There is, in a jail, better air, better company, better conveniency of every kind, and a ship has the additional disadvantage of being in danger. So clearly Johnson was very aware um, that if Barber's ship was taken, there was nothing he could do to help him. Barber spent the next two years on board the Stag, uh, but luckily for Johnson, he never made it further than the Kent coast. Johnson's fear did get the better of him, though, as he wrote to the Navy and had Barber discharged. So on the 8th of August, 1760, Barber was discharged from the Navy, and it's very much the actions of an overbearing father who thinks he knows what's best for his son. On the matter, though, Barber told Boswell much later that he'd been discharged through Dr. Johnson's application without any wish of his own, which I think is kind of telling. Uh, at this point, he's around 18 years old. His circumstances aren't much better than they had been a few years prior. There's no point going back to the apothecary or a similar place again. He's been discharged from the Navy, which could have been the only path that he was actually interested in and enjoyed. So he didn't really have much choice other than to join Johnson's household again. So he spent the next six years in Johnson's household. But it's at this point that we start seeing glimpses of Barber having his own social life. Um, for example, a Cambridge undergraduate called Baptist Noel Turner had been a semi-regular visitor of Johnson's. And on one occasion, he came to visit and climbed the stairs to the lodgings to a dingy ante room that led to Johnson's study. Johnson wasn't in, but Barber and his friends were. He said that the doctor was absent, and when Francis Barber, his black servant, opened the door to tell me so, a group of his African countrymen were sitting around a fire in the gloomy ante room. And on, and on there, all turning their sooty faces at once to, to stare at me, they presented a curious spectacle. So here is the first time that we see Barber with a company entirely of his own choosing. It's significant, though, because job adverts and conduct, conduct books of the time uh, made it clear that masters did not permit their servants to have any visitors. Instead, Johnson clearly allowed Barber to entertain at his home, and his choice of friends is also interesting. He's no longer isolated in a white society and was part of the broader black community in London at the time. And there were also occasions where this community gathered together. For example, in February 1764, <clears throat> the London Chronicle reported a social event. They said, among the sundry fashionable roots or clubs that are held in town, that of the blacks or Negro servants is not the least. On Wednesday nights last no less than 57 of them, men and women, supped, drank, and entertained themselves with dancing and music, 
consisting of violins, French horns, and other instruments at a public house on Fleet Street till four in the morning. No whites were allowed to be present, for all the performers were black. It's a very striking and jocular image. It's a gathering exclusively for black people with food and music and dancing in a pub in the heart of London. We don't know for certain whether Barbara was there, but given the proximity of, jo of Johnson's lodgings to Fleet Street, as well as the suggestion in the report that this wasn't an isolated incident, it's tempting to wonder if he too may have joined these nights. However, in 1766, Johnson was awarded his pension, and this financial security enabled him to send Barber to school again. So he sent Barber to Bishop Stortford Grammar School. It was a very highly regarded school, and it was a similar schooling to what Johnson had experienced in Litchfield. He clearly had high hopes for Barber and was ambitious for him. And again, it's another move by Johnson which is both authoritative, but also affectionate and hopeful. And some people have suggested that Johnson had hopes for Barber becoming a missionary or a scholar. And while an excellent education is beneficial, and again, very rare for someone like Barber, and it could have set him in good stead, Johnson's again kind of missing something. In 1766, Barber's around 24 years old, whereas all his classmates were a lot younger than him. Again, we don't have any record of what, jo of what Barber felt about this, but it can't have been that fun. But it's during these years that Johnson spent more and more time in Streatham with the Thrale family. Um, in 1771, Barber returned to London. Johnson's very much a celebrity by now and is frequently mentioned in the newspapers. And with Barber accompanying him everywhere, it meant too that he often was mentioned as well, but not always in preferable ways. It's at this time as well that we start seeing a bit of a love life for Barber. Attracting women was an area of life which Barber was notably successful. Uh, even Hester Thrale grudgingly admitted that Barber was very well looking. Uh, and in her journal in 1777, she recorded Johnson's response to that remark. Oh, madam, says he, Francis has carried the empire of Cupid further than, it, than many men. When he was in Lincolnshire seven years ago, he made hay, as I was informed, with so much dexterity that a female haymaker followed him to London for love. It's extreme. Uh, but in 1773, however, one young woman clearly caught Barbara's eye. On Thursday, 28th of January, 1773, Barber married Elizabeth Ball at the Church of St. Dunstan in the West. She was about 17 or 18 years old at this point, described as eminently pretty and sensible and well-informed. And then, of course, Barber apparently is very beautiful. Uh, but he was around 31 years old. Now, the age gap wasn't necessarily unusual, but the interracial aspect is worth examining. It's estimated that around 80% of the black population in London at this time was male. So it's statistically more likely that a black man is gonna marry a white woman. But the total black population in the city was only about a few thousand. Therefore, the interracial aspect is unusual, but the gender dynamic wasn't particularly. Reactions to the marriage were varied. Some people were outright hostile, and at the very best, they were an object of curiosity, compounded by Johnson's celebrity status. A lot of the hostility was towards Barber's wife. For example, in his biography, John Hawkins, who's the guy at the end, um, wrote, in his search of a wife, he picked up one of those creatures with whom, in the disposal of themselves, no contrariety of color is an obstacle. Hester Thrale, equally, could never bring herself to use Elizabeth Barber's name, instead referring to her as his wife, or more often, and tellingly, his white wife, and on one occasion, his Desdemona. They named their firstborn Samuel, after Johnson. Sadly, however, the baby died after 14 months. It took them another six years before they tried again, and they had a daughter called Elizabeth, followed by another daughter called Anne, and then finally a son, again called Samuel. Barber and his family lived with Johnson and became part of his household. Johnson even gifted Barber's wife many items and books that had belonged to his own wife, Tetty. And this demonstrates, I think, the genuine familial love and connection between them and what you, know, you can only really hope for in an in-law. In December 1784, uh, Johnson passed away after very lengthy battles with ill health. And in the lead up, he sold most of his books in order to create a trust for Barber and his family. 
He also left many crucial belongings to Barber, including his more valuable objects like his cane, as well as more personal ones like his wedding ring. The trust was around £1,500, which is a very significant amount and way more than would normally be left to a servant. What is telling, though, is that the executors of the trust were John Hawkins, Joshua Reynolds, and Dr. William Scott. The terms are also very telling. The money and goods were not left to Barber outright, but on trust, and they were applied to the three trustees in such manner as they shall judge most fit and available to his benefit. In other words, it was the trustees who were in control, not Barber. Leaving such a... Oh, the wrong bit, sorry. Um, so it's interesting kind of yeah, dynamic that he's established there. Uh, Hester Thrale, um, who was now Piozzi, um, was also far from happy that the gifts that she had given Johnson many years ago were now in the hands of Barber and even tried to get some of them back from Elizabeth Barber after Francis's death. There were also disagreements over some of the items that Johnson had left Barber. For example, Hawkins managed to seize a gold-headed cane, which had accidentally been left in Johnson's house after his death, but was very much intended for Barber. Joshua Reynolds was very adamant that Barber should be given the cane, but unfortunately, Hawkins kept it in his house, which, funnily enough, caught fire, uh, and he said that the cane was burnt in there as well. Uh, in October 1785, Barber and his family had had enough. They left London and they moved to Lichfield, which again is where Johnson was originally from. Now this could be for a number of reasons. One, much cheaper than London. Two, it's familiar territory uh, since Barber had accompanied Johnson on his numerous visits there. And again, maybe there was that sentimentality around it as well. The family even rented from old friends of Johnson. They rented from a Mrs. Jane Gastrell, who was a sister of Molly and Elizabeth Aston, who were contemporaries of Johnson and had known him all their lives. However, Barber was still followed by Johnson's celebrity status, and the first biographies were beginning to be published at this point. For example, John Hawkins, again, was one of the first biographers, and his presentation of Barber was very harsh and, for a modern reader, uh, very much steeped in racism. However, Barber did correspond with Boswell and was very important in Boswell's life of Johnson. Boswell only met Johnson in 1763, by which time Johnson is already very famous, and he was therefore very reliant on people like Barber who had known Johnson before this, especially during the dictionary years. And who would be better equipped for this than someone who had largely grown up under Johnson's care, um, essentially as an adopted son, and had witnessed some of the darkest moments of Johnson's life, as well as the most triumphant. In this way, Barber was not only able to set the record straight, unlike biographers like Hawkins, but it was also instrumental in the compiling of a book which is now broadly seen as one of the best biographies ever written. However, the bad press on Barber did its damage and he struggled to find work. He and his wife uh, had to resort to selling many of Johnson's possessions. In 1797, the family moved to Burntwood and in a last desperate attempt for success, Barber set up a school, which very likely makes him the first black schoolmaster in England. And despite being connected with one of the most celebrated men of letters and having an excellent education which was very similar to Johnson's own, his pa their parents at this school clearly had a problem with their child being taught by a black man and the school closed after only a few years. At this point, Barber starts to suffer from ill health, frequently complaining about his eyesight and lung trouble. And by the end, there's not much money left and the family had become very reliant on parish provisions under the poor law. And on the 13th of January, 1801, Barber died and was buried in St. Mary's Church in Stafford. His first daughter, Elizabeth, didn't survive her father that long uh, and sadly died in March the following year. His son, the other Samuel, uh, was sent to a boarding school and his wife and the remaining daughter, Anne, moved to Litchfield. Uh, after the mother's death, Anne moved in with her brother, Samuel, who was working for the famous Burslem Potter Enoch Wood, uh, who would have been an apprentice of Josiah Wedgwood. <clears throat> Samuel Barber became a potter's printer, preparing the designs to be transferred onto the property, onto the pottery, sorry. Uh, transfer printing was a huge technological advancement in the 19th century, and the pottery industry in Staffordshire included some of the leading manufacturers in Europe. <clears throat> 
In this way, Samuel Barber contributed to an incredibly important part of English history. Samuel also rose the ranks in the Methodist Church, becoming, we think, the first black Methodist preacher in England. Michael Bundock, who has written this wonderful biography of Francis Barber, I recommend it, um, he's also amazingly been able to trace Francis Barber's descendants down to the present day. And there's a guy called Cedric Barber living in Staffordshire who is uh, Francis Barber's direct descendant. So Barber's life is at times contradictory, um, but it's amazing. He's gone from this journey throughout his life from being coming from an enslaved you know, birth on a plantation to being brought to London, growing up with Johnson and being connected with some of the most celebrated and greatest literary minds in the 18th century. But there's also really deeply human and important aspects to his life. Just within London, he experiences outward racism from people and institutions which ban him from following certain career paths. He experiences the isolation and life as a member of a minority community and all the social issues that come with that. But we also see glimmers of a man who, at least in some points, enjoys a social life, be that buying tobacco with other sailors in the Navy or sitting around a fireplace with friends, enjoying attention from women, falling in love, starting a family, having at least one type of parental figure in his life, even if he was a bit overbearing at times. And we also see a figure who, despite all these setbacks and rejections he faced because of the color of his skin, he has a fighting spirit. He stands up for himself as a very young boy. He attempts two career paths and, even as an older man, sets a record by being the first schoolmaster um, who's black in England. These are all personal qualities and achievements he makes himself, not as Johnson's servant or an adopted son, and they're incredibly impressive and admirable to anyone, no matter the time period. So, yeah, that's all from me, <laughs> and thank you.